Scripture. We're going to be reading out of Psalm 27 this morning. Psalm 27. I'm going to read the whole psalm, okay? It says, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strong defense of my life. Whom shall I tread or dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in this I trust. One thing I've asked from Yahweh that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of Yahweh, to behold the beauty of Him is what it's saying, to inquire in His temple. For in the day of calamity He will conceal me in His shelter. In the secret place of His tent He will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock and now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. I will offer in his tents or in his tent sacrifices with a loud shouts of joy. I will sing, I will sing praises to Yahweh. Hear, O Yahweh, when I call with my voice, be gracious to me and answer me. On your behalf, my heart says, seek my face. Your face, O Yahweh, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your slave away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but Yahweh will take me up. Instruct me in your way, O Yahweh. Lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not give me over to desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. Such as breath breathe out violence, I would have despaired unless I believed that I would see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. Hope in Yahweh, be strong, let your heart take courage. Hope in Yahweh, hope in Him. Amen. You may be seated. This is a psalm of David. This is a psalm of David. He's, he's announcing a psalm. He's announcing the song, if you will, to the one who is to the one who is trust lies in. To trust in his Redeemer, in his Lord, in his God. But in this psalm, he he points to something very interesting as he picks it up in verse 4, 5, and 6. He talks about how he, how he will find his rest. How he longs to find his rest. Where in Yahweh? He longs to find his rest simply in the congregation. In the congregation of Yahweh. In the presence of Yahweh, in the house of the Most High God, in the house of God. And he says this in verse 4, 5, and 6. Oh, how I, paraphrase it, oh, how I long to be, simply put, in the midst of his congregation. Oh, how I long to be in the midst of His people. We've all read Hebrews 10.25. Simply tells us, Do not neglect, forsake the assembly, the congregation, if at all possible, of believers. Understand that you know we all from time to time cannot make it that's understandable. We see that. We get that. But here you see a few, a few remarks by David in Psalm 27 to what congregational worship does. 
what it does, what it gives to be in the midst of other believers to a man who longs to be there, a man who longs to be in that presence. A, long, a man who longs to be there and behold the beauty of the glorious God, the creator of, of heaven and earth. Listen to what he says as he leads us down to verse 4 of Psalm 27. As David is struggling with the enemy, possibly Saul. The Lord is my light and my sal salvation. Why should I be afraid is simply what he's saying. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is my strong defense. The Lord is my strong defense in my life. Whom shall I dread? He's my fortress. He protects me from my enemy. He protects me from danger. Why do I find myself what? Trembling. Trembling. We all find ourselves in that space or area of life from time to time and most do not find themselves as believers there as David is speaking of in Psalm 27 as the enemy is seeking to what? To take his life and you can understand the fear, you can understand the, the trembling a little bit. You can understand the longing but he knows and believes and understands and he sees in the back of his mind that true light, true peace is only found in the very one that, that, that reached out in that field one day to that 12 year old boy and said, and said, this one's mine. This one's the one that I'm going to raise up to be the next king of the land. He's learned to, to rest in that God. He's learned to rest in that Redeemer. He's learned to rest in Him. He's learning to not fear, but to rest in the One who's chosen Him. He's learned to rest in the One who gives Him a strong defense within His life. You know, in our lives, we too must learn we must learn to rest in the one who gives us a, a strong defense in our lives to not dread no one to not dread anything but to rest in him he says when evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh my adversaries and my enemies they stumbled they fell around me when evil people come, when they came to devour me, when they came to destroy me, it was you, O oh God, it was you, it was you that made them stumble. It was you that made them fall. It was you. He acknowledges what? He's not acknowledging anything about himself in the sense of, it was me that won the victory. It was me that overcame my enemy. It was me that gives me protection. It was me that gives me direction. He says nothing of that. What is he saying? Listen, he's saying, when my enemy comes upon me, when my enemy seeks to devour me, it's you, O oh God. It's you, who gives me who, it's you who gives me rest. It's you who gives me protection. It's you who keeps me from stumbling and falling. But it's you who allows them, them, the enemy, to stumble and to fall. Though a mighty army, though a mighty army, he's talking in verse 3, though a host camp or a mighty army comes against me, my heart will not, my heart will learn to not fear. Though war will rise against me, I'm going to learn to what? I'm learning to trust in you. I'm learning to trust in you. I'm learning from my rest to be in you. When the news comes tomorrow or next week or five years from now, news that you do not want to hear, I pray that we all by that time have learned to trust 
and accept the news and understand and remember that no matter how bad the news may be, no matter how terrible the news may be, no matter how bad and terrible it might be personal or to our family or to our loved one, that we, that we learn to trust in Him, right? We learn to trust in Him. David's speaking of this as the enemy is coming upon him, as the enemy is looking for him. Some scholars said it was Saul. Others have said it was other men that sought the life of David. But he says something very interesting in verse 4, speaking of rest in the sanctuary of God. Listen to what he says in verse 4. But one thing I ask from Yahweh, one thing I ask from you, O God, one thing I ask of the Lord. The one thing I seek most is to live in the house, is what he's saying. Is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. One thing I ask, O oh God, is that I may what? Is to live in your presence, to live in your purpose, to live within your house. I mean, we can look at it as our life is to live in your congregation, to be around your people, be with them. To behold the beauty of who you are collectively. To worship you, O oh God. To rest in you. When you come in to worship the Most High God, it's at times, no doubt, for all of us, it's a place of rest. It's a place of rest. It's a place to move away from everything outside that door. It's a place of rest. It's a place of refuge, peace. As Justin said this morning in Sunday school class, and many, many, many years ago, as the church, even in, in America, it was a church that was focused on what? A body of believers that come in for rest in the worship of a holy God but now it's turned into this bring in all your lost loved ones hopefully and they come to faith in Jesus and that's the drive but listen the church house was was what was designed for what for a body of believers to come in corporately as one and to rest and to focus and to praise and to sit under the cover in the wings of the Most High God to glorify Him, to uplift Him, to praise Him for who He is, our Lord, our God. Psalm 122, verse 1 says this, Another psalm of David. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of what? The Lord. David says in Psalm 122, I was glad when he said, Let us go into his house. Let us go into his house and let us worship him. Let us sit in his presence. Amongst other believers. Let us rest there. Let us find cover there. Let us find praise there. Let us worship Him. Let us go there. I was glad, he says, in 122 verse 1. I was happy when they said, Let us go into His sanctuary. 
Let us go there and, and let us worship Him. See, that should be your desire. That should be my desire as we just look really quickly in Psalm 122 verse 1. It should be our desire, should it not? To long and want to be in the presence of other believers corporately in worship of the Most High God. I say it all the time, this is not about you. This is about Him. That's the sad thing about it when you see so many churches with so few people, so many biblically minded churches with so few people in the pews anymore. How is that? Somewhere along the line, they made it about themselves and not about Him. Somewhere along the line, it become about themselves and not about Him. I've been saying it for a long time. We've had it too easy, too long in America. Too easy, too long. We've grown complacent. We've grown slothful. We've grown to expect ease of living every day. But I think that that's about to change. It may be the Lord's going to call the church out a little bit if He tarries. Psalm 84 verse 1, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's army. Psalm 84, How lovely is your dwelling place. How lovely is your place of what? Rest. How lovely it is to, to rest there in your dwelling place, O Lord God. How lovely is that? This again, this again is the words of someone, of someone who knows what it is to, to long and to desire the place of God, the worship of God. My soul has longed and even fainted for the courts of Yahweh, it says in 84 verse 2. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. I long for this. I long for this. You know, Sunday should not be. Uh, it's Saturday night. I gotta roll out of bed tomorrow and find my way to church. But unfortunately for a lot of people, that's the mentality, is it not? But it should be, tomorrow's the day of worship. Tomorrow's a day of praise. Tomorrow's a day of rest. Tomorrow's a day when I can come into the presence of other believers. And we can worship as one, together. The very one that saved our souls. We can give Him praise. We can give Him glory. We can give Him honor. We don't look at it as a, as a burdensome stone around our neck of time, if you will. Because that's exactly what it is to a lot of people. It's just burdensome stone around the neck of their what? Time. So what do you mean time? It's because we've consumed ourselves with so much. We consumed ourselves with so much of where we, we limit ourselves and we have very little time and, and now that is encroached many years ago into the Sunday worship. It's found its way into the house of God and to where now most churches do not see it as a high priority to come back on Sunday night. They just do not and Nothing set in stone as far as coming back on Sunday night by no means in our society, but what a joy it is to be in congregational worship, 
Listen, I got seven days a week. All I got, if all I got to do is give the Lord as far as worship congregationally one day, think about that. I mean, if you want to look at it that way, not that we shouldn't worship Him every day of our lives, of course we should. But one day, He says He has set aside for us to come together as a congregation. And to worship Him. Verse 4 of Psalm 84. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Selah. How blessed are they who dwell in your house. What joy it is for those who long to live in your house. What joy it is for those who long to be in your presence. What joy it is for those who long to to come together as a congregation and to worship you, O God. What joy it is. How blessed they are. You're a blessed people. There's not many of us here. Listen, it doesn't matter. You're still a blessed people. You're in the house of God worshiping the very one who has saved you. You're blessed. You're blessed. You're in His house. You're worshiping Him and who He is. Back to Psalm 27 verse 4. Back to what David says. He says he's talking about, he says, the one thing, the one thing I desire the most, the one thing I ask from Yahweh, from the Lord God that I seek To live in His presence. To be in the house of the Lord. To be in His presence. To be worshiping Him. I've stood at the chair of my share of older people as they come to the end of their lives and believers. And they're physically unable to do much anymore. Especially come to church. Or stood at the bed of ones that were just, they, they knew their time wasn't long. And, and as believers, every one of them had this in common. Every one of them had what I'm about to say in common. Not one yet. Every believer has had this in common. They wished they could get up and go to church. Even those that have admitted, I, I, I took church, I took worship, I took congregational worship of the Lord God, I took it for granted for a long time in my life. Even them admit and say, oh, the time I've wasted away. Or those that made congregational worship a high priority. Oh, how I long if I can just go just another time. But I can't. My body won't allow me to anymore. Listen, if you live long enough as a believer, if you live long enough, it's coming to you too. Don't take for granted. No matter if there's eight people in here, 28, 58, or 108, never take for granted what you have in the ability to get in your car in 20 degree temperature, turn the heat on. Man, we live in a day and time where you can push a button, turn the heat on before you even get there. And go into a house, and go into a building when you can worship the Most High God. Do not take that for granted. Because listen, like I said, if you live long enough, sooner or later it's coming. It's going to be no more. It's going to be no more. One thing I asked from Yahweh is that I seek. That I may dwell in His house, Yahweh, all the days of my life. Remember, He's, he's speaking. He's, this psalm is about being chased after by the enemy. To be in his house all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of Yahweh. To inquire of him in his temple. 
For in a day of calamity, he will conceal me in his shelter. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. Not only is his place of worship a place of rest, but it's a place, David says, of cover. Refuge. It's a place of cover. When trouble comes, it's a place of cover. Have you ever felt that before? And I'm not getting emotional here. Have you ever felt you're just going through so much in the world, you walk through the door, you sit down, and you rest, and you, and you seriously think about the music that's being sung and, 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 the, and the words that are coming off the pages of Scripture, and, and it's just this, this peace, this refuge, this relaxation that comes upon you. God's Word... It's a place of refuge. His sanctuary is a place of refuge. His sanctuary is a place of cover from the outside world that seeks to what? That seeks to always make trouble in your life. To disrupt your worship. To disrupt your plans of prayer. And David here is, he's way above me. He's way, he's way beyond me. He's going through so much. The enemy is at the door, if you will. The, the human enemy is longing for his life. And he says, for in the day of my calamity, for in the day of my trouble, simply put, he will conceal me in his shelter. He will conceal me in his arms. In a secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on his rock, on a high rock. What does it mean by lift me up? David is saying, when I need it, it's the Lord that lifts me up high enough. Listen. Listen. Out of the reach of the enemy. He lifts me high enough up out of the reach of the enemy. What did Christ say to Peter? When Peter jumped up and he thought he can just take on the demons, he thought he can take on Satan, the Lord Jesus turns to Peter and says, What? Peter, he says, Satan will what? He will sift you as wheat, young man. He will sift you as wheat. You're nothing. You're nothing against him. You only are what you are because what? Because of my what? Protection in your life. The only reason why you are who you are, Peter. Peter, if you try to do this on your own, you will crash and burn the minute you leave the gate of the race, if you will. It's not about your strength, Peter. The only thing you're capable of doing, Peter, is screwing something up. It's me, Peter. It's me who will lift you high out of the reach of the enemy. I will place you out of the reach on a high rock. I don't know when I'm sitting on that side and someone is preaching on this side. It's a different, it's a different breath. Listen, I'm telling you, I, I sit there and I can take it in in a, in a far different way. Not only is the congregation, the sanctuary of God's people, places of rest and places of cover. In verse 6, Now my head will be lifted, lifted up above my enemies around me. I will offer up in his tents, or in his tent, sacrifices, loud shouts of joy. I will sing, I will sing praises to what? To Yahweh, I will sing praises unto Him. 
In other words, at his sanctuary, David says, I long to be in his sanctuary. I long to be in his presence. I long to be with other believers. I long to be with them. Offering what? Offering sacrifices and shouts of joy. Singing praises to the Lord with music. I long to do that. And I'm here running around as the enemy is seeking to destroy me. But I long to be singing praises unto Him. Singing praises unto Him in a place of rest. In a place of other believers in a congregation setting, in a corporate worship. I long to be singing praises to Him sing a song or two in the morning because hey, it's just what everybody does we sing praises unto the Lord music unto the Lord to praise Him to glorify Him to lift Him I mean I don't know about, I don't know about myself I mean I sound horrible but it's not about us it's about what? it's about glorifying Him It's about our voices glorifying Him no matter how bad our voices sound, it's still to glorify Him. David says, At His sanctuary I will offer sacrifices and shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord God with music. You know, of course, this is not the only place that you can sing and praise the Lord God in church. We understand that you're singing and praising that can be outside the outside the sanctuary, if you will. Outside the church house. Outside the tent. But you see the desire. I want you to see the desire of a believer in the Lord God. As he desires to be amongst other believers in the worship of the very one who has chosen him unto salvation. We were just talking about this this morning in Sunday school class. Listen, I, I, I'm to the point in my life where the more I read Scripture, the more I study, the, you know, as the, just the more you move on as a believer, it's, it's very difficult for me to accept somebody that claims to be a believer, claims to be a Christian, but yet just has no absolute no desire for the presence, the corporate worship of a Most High God. They just have nothing. I have trouble believing that they are even of the faith. Because you see in Scripture time and time and time and time again, not perfect by no means. But those that are of the faith, they long to be in the presence of others that are of the faith. And if they can't be there, they think about it. If they can't be there, they're still in prayer. If they can't be there, they're still in worship in their own time. But to have somebody that claims to be of the faith, but yet has no desire for prayer, no desire of corporate worship, no desire to praise the Lord, no desire to serve the Lord whatsoever, but her, his or her only desire is to serve self, and that's it, well, that has to come into question sooner or later whether they're in or, of, or out of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to. Here you see somebody whose desire is what? Is to serve the Lord, is to worship the Lord, is to praise the Lord, is to thank the Lord for everything He has done in His life. This is a portrait. Listen, you could you could have titled this sermon if you want to title it a portrait of a true believer. Could you have not? A portrait of a true believer. You could have went that way with it. I'm going to turn really quick to Joel. Joel chapter 2. Joel's after Hosea. It's a really small book. And as you move through the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2. And I'll give you a minute to find your way there. Joel 
I'm going to read on down in Joel chapter 2 a little bit and kind of look at something in Joel chapter 2 about the announcement to go into the house of the house of God in Joel chapter 2. Okay? Listen to what it says. Start at verse 1. We're going to pick up what I want to focus on in verse 12. Blow a trumpet at Zion. O oh, make a loud shout on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of Yahweh is coming. Surely it is near. A, dark, a day of darkness and thick darkness. A day of clouds and dense gloom. As the dawn is spread over the mountains. So there is numerous and mighty people. There has never been anything like it. Nor will there be again after it. For in the years from generation to generation. A fire consumes before them. Behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them. Nothing at all escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. Like war horses, they run. With a loud noise of chariots, they leap on the tops of mountains. The crackling of flames of fire consume the stubble. Let a mighty people range for battle. Before them, before them, the peoples are withering all faces turn pale. They run like mighty men. They climb up the wall like men of war. They each march in line. And they do not deviate from their past. They do not crowd each other. They march everyone in his path. When they fall against the defending weapons, they do not break ranks. They rush onto the city. They run on the wall. They climb up into the houses. They enter the windows like a thief. Before them the earth trembles. The heavens quake. The sun and the moon grow dark. The star loses their brightness. But Yahweh gives forth his voice before his military force. Surely his camp is very numerous. For mighty is he who does his word. The day of Yahweh is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? We've got judgment coming against Judah. Verse 12. Yet even now declare, declares the Yahweh, declare, declares the, the Lord. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Tear your heart and not your garments. Now return to Yahweh your God, for he is gracious, he is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, relenting concerning evil, who knows whether he will turn or relent. Leave a blessing behind him, even a drink offering and a drink, a grain offering and a drink offering for Yahweh your God. Blow a trumpet in Zion, set apart a, a fast as holy, call for a solemn assembly, gather the people set apart, the congregation as holy. Assemble the elders, gather the infants of the nursing babies, let the bridegroom come out of his room, the bride out of her bridal chamber, let the priests, the ministers of Yahweh, weep between the porch and the altar, let them say, pity your people, O Yahweh. Do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, where is their God? What in the world is happening? Judgment has come against Yahweh. Judgment has come against, uh, or judgment has come against Judah, the holy, the holy land, if you will, by a holy God. The Lord God is, is judging Judah at this time. And what happens? A call of repentance is announced. After the call of repentance is announced by the Holy God uh, you know, to Judah, where does it say for them to go? Gather your people into the congregation. Gather your people into the assembly. Gather your people into what? The sanctuary. Gather who? Gather some? No. Let them all come. Let the elders come. Let the priests come. Let the bride come out of her bridal chamber. Let the bridegroom come out of his room. Listen to this. Even let the babies come. Even let the infants and the nursing children come. And to the congregation... 
as they repent to the Most High God. You see, listen. Not only is this place a house of rest, a house of cover, a house of peace, a house of praise, but also at times in Scripture, it was a house, it was a congregation of repentance. Of repentance. Here you see plainly in Joel chapter 2, a house of repentance. A call to repentance. A call to the people in verse 15 to come to a, a sanctuary meeting. So sure of the calling that it just wasn't for the adults. But listen to this. As I just said a minute ago, even the nursing babies, you bring them in. Even the children, you bring them in. To what? To see, to experience what true congregational repentance is. See, we, we live in a different day and time, do we not, when it comes to children. We push them off to the side. They cry too much, they whine too much, they jump around too much, and we, we push them out of the congregation and we create what we call children's church or whatever else Christianity today or Lifeway wants to create in their books, and we follow that lead. I don't see that here. Gather all the people, the elders, the children, even the babies. Gather all for this time of congregational repentance. Gather them. And let it be true repentance. In verse 13, it says what? In verse 13, tear your heart and not your garments. What does that mean? You see, at this day and time, one of the ways to show repentance was what? They would tear the clothes and some would be truthful about it, others would not be truthful about it, but listen, listen. This repentance I'm calling on you, Judah, to do in my house, in my congregation, is a repentance of your heart. Not a repentance of show but a repentance of your heart. I remember many years ago as I was sitting in a class and it was like some preacher class that was put together for guys that thought they were called to preach or were called to preach and, and they were talking about, they had a class on invitations or something at that day and time, but so I ended up having to sit through this, this class and, and they were lining and they were given direction on how to do the invitation. This is how the direction was done. I still remember it clear as day because it was so so crazy to me. They said, now here's what happens in your church. You, know, you have a certain amount of people walk down first and act like they're going to give their hearts to the Lord, if you will. And then that will get the flow going. Don't tear your clothing in an act of false grief or false repentance. But tear your hearts instead. There's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference. Just quickly, as we looked in Joel chapter 2, this, this house is just not just a house of rest, cover, or praise, but it's also a house of repentance. Sometimes we come in and we just need to get alone with the Lord and something we found ourselves caught up in the week before or whatever it may be and it was no different with no different with Judah no different with us so listen as we close this morning 
As we come in here each and every week, we don't come in here for ourselves, but we come in here to, as one, worship Him. As one, worship Him. Whether there's five, like I said, or however many. We come together as one to worship Him. For Him to be glorified, for Him to be praised, we do not forsake the assembling of gathering together. If we can help it. For it's for His glory, for His honor, alone. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank You for this time this morning as we come into Your house and we glorify You. You be honored, You be praised, You be magnified, Lord, and just take Your word. Lord, may we May we dwell on your word. May we apply it back to our lives. May we thank you for all that you have done for us. Bring us back here this evening to once again look upon your truth. And as we take a few minutes this morning, Lord, for this business meeting, Lord, may it be done for your glory, for your honor. May we do it under the eyes of you. In your name we pray. Amen.